Do you have any advice for anyone watching this, or listening, who is considering adapting something or even just considering sitting down to write a novel or to, you know, to, to write? What would you say, what would you give as, as a piece of advice to people sitting down to that blank page? You know, you asked a question about how I started in writing. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly remember that there was a book I remember sitting in the ROM, in Druxies in the ROM, with our <laughs> little children running around. My friend said, you know, um, a friend of mine has a book. And she named the book, and we loved, a book we loved. And she, does, she just wants someone to help her write a treatment because she has no money. And I said, we can do that. Because we, we both loved the book. And of course, not knowing anything about it, we didn't write a treatment. We wrote 150-page screenplay because we didn't know, you know, that's how you write a treatment when you're just starting out. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much doing it. We didn't end up writing screenplay for it. But I learned so much doing it because I loved the book so much. And it really made me think about, well, I, you know, it really drew me in. How would you make this book into a screenplay? So I think, you know, love of something is always a good place to start. Sure. If it's, you know, whether it's, you know, in a way, it didn't matter that it didn't get made or I didn't get paid for it. It was really just that I, t I discovered that I liked writing doing that. Yeah, I, that I liked sitting alone in a chair and just my own thoughts. So yes. that might be one way to go. That's great. Yeah, because I think sometimes we can get really bogged down in ooh, the technique of it, or mm. the right way it yeah. gets presented, or the way that it yeah. gets optioned or sold, or all the sort of businessy things. I wouldn't read a book first. Right. I would start first. Yeah. And then oh. Figure out what you d need to know after that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> start first. I like that. That's great. Any other advice? You, you know, I probably get maybe one email or something a week about somebody wanting advice on becoming a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, every single writer I know has had a different path. So it's kind of hard to give very specific advice. And if somebody writes and among their questions are, do you triple space and how wide are the margins? I think, this isn't for you. <laughs> this is not, if these are your questions, uh -huh. this is not for you. Right. But, and, and, uh, and, I, and I, it's very hard to give advice, but I always feel like, and I go to myself as an example, if you want to be a writer, you're probably already writing. Right. Like I was starting in grade three or four. So if you're thinking, I just like to be a writer, how would you go about that? It's not for you. And, and, the, only other, and the other advice, and I'm not the first to give it, is if you want to be a writer, you have to be a reader. And, and you know, people say, well, I'd really love to be a writer, but I don't have much time to read. Well, it's like, a, I, a, well, I want to be a chef, but I don't enjoy eating that much. Right, yeah, right. You know? So I think, well, that's not for you. So it's very hard to give advice, but I think if you're, if you're a writer, you're writing, and you're reading. And that's the first, I mean, if you're not doing that, forget the rest. Right, good advice. I would just add, uh, work with um, really hard uh, uh, deadlines on yourself. Yeah. Which, it's hard because sometimes you think it's, uh, or a lot of people think it's more about art. And you, that happens to me too, you end up spending too much time fighting over one word or two words, which at the end, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If you have your structure and just put hard lines and work towards those deadlines, that's much easier and you'll get done faster. Yeah. I like house building. Building. Yeah, yeah, like house building. It's great. I like how people think it's glamorous. Oh yes. It's just such gla it's just wow. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> like, like if you like if Let's you watch that, that if you watch the <laughs> if you watch the series The Affair and he becomes a writer and he's going and this one and how he's at an orgy and now he's sleeping with his agent. And that's <laughs> what I think. I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty much my life. <laughs> that's what happens to me. Do you just point people to that series and say that's what my life that's is? Right. When, when, that's when right. When there was a part where he was he was gonna end up sleeping with his publicist. <laughs> An editor I know said, most publicists that I know don't want to sleep with their authors, they want to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> that's more realistic. That's great. And do you find that you're still, um, do you, when you're starting a new project, do you get plagued? I know you talked about writer's block not being a thing that, you know, that, that we have the luxury to have, but do you find it challenging to start a new project? Do you find that starting is easy and then you get sort of partway through and then you hit a block? Do you have a pattern? Or, or do you really find it, as you've written, that it's easy to step into a new project? I find every time I finish one, finish a book, I think I could never do this again. Interesting. Like you just think, 
I'm, I'm spent. I've used up every idea I ever had. I can never do this again. And, and then in about two weeks, I think, oh, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, but I find that it doesn't get, I mean, I've done about 20 novels now, and I find it doesn't get easier. Uh, the challenge is, well, what can I do that brings something that's fresh or that's different and not do exactly what I did before? I mean, I want to do the things I did before that people like, but I don't want to do the exact same story. So I find, and I find every, every book I've done, I've learned something hmm. new that I think, oh, I won't make that mistake again. <laughs> and then in the next book, I make a new mistake. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, for me, it doesn't get easier. Okay. Yeah, Susan? Uh, I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> uh, I have to trick myself into starting. Uh, and I have a number of tricks over the years now to start. And one of them is just like, just write one terrible line. <laughs> That's all you have to do. And as, as soon as you start writing, if you write, rewriting, you, oh, I don't know how to fix this. Well, uh, there's only one thing I know how to fix. There's only, oh, so I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. And then you trick yourself because you start, oh, that, well, actually, that could be better. And, so I, I'm not sort of um, I'm not a cheerful writer until I'm into it. Um, right. But then when I get into it, I like it. But uh, starting is hard. I find. I like how much that mirrors the Charles Dickens's experience it's a in that personal. film. <laughs> yeah, it's a little personal. It ended up being quite a personal film. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, I was as you were describing it. I'm like, hmm, yeah, yeah, that yeah, seems yeah. familiar. Yeah, yeah. What's wrong with you? Um, to me, I would just say that um, every time I finish a project whatever project it is, I am totally ready to, to never see it again. Mm -hmm. Like almost nauseated by it. Mm, yeah. Like if you, the equivalent of having, let's say Indian food for two months, even though you love it, but if you have it for two months, at the end you don't want to see Indian food for six months. Right. So I'm very happy to go to a new project and have an Italian food or mm -hmm. Chinese food, whatever, and then be like, I don't want to taste that taste anymore right. for a long time yeah so do you, yeah <laughs> do you do you guys find that you're the the worst judge of your own work that you you lose mm -hmm. perspective and you can't you don't know anymore if it's good or terrible or what yeah, yeah definitely all the time yeah. Mm -hmm. i take stuff out that i've decided is terrible and the producers say why did you take that out <laughs> I, I i'm not I, I don't know how you can be it's two different parts of your brain and yeah all. i think mm. you get so close to it that mm. you know you can't you no longer can see what's not working but you don't even see what is it's working. working it's true you just you it's just you're, you need you're good too close for too long good editors yeah. yeah that's what I was, I was going to ask do you have people that you tend to uh, work with or ask for feedback from I know sometimes you're working in a setting where you're working with a particular set of producers or other stakeholders in the project but personally when you're working on something are there people you like to send it to to get feedback on who you trust or who understand your work is that a, is that a part of your process at all I find well for, I'm, of course I'm still a newbie in terms of the adaptations and working in in movies and television but I find that in that field there's no shortage of people who are willing to offer advice <laughs> uh, but when you're writing most of my experience the last 15 20 years has been writing novels which is a very solitary process and I do have a couple people well the first person usually who reads my book is my agent and I have a friend that I've, uh, uh, I used to work with at the Toronto Star uh, a guy named Bill Taylor, I often send him my book to read first mm. and get his sense of it. Mm. And um, But it's just, it's a long time to spend with something. You know, it takes me two to three months to write a first draft. It's a long time to spend and you think if you made a mistake the first week you started writing and went off in the wrong direction, there's a lot to fix. Mm. You hope if you make a mistake it's sort of towards the end. Mm. But um, but yeah, you once you're done you really need some, some input. Mm -hmm. And how do you manage all of those voices coming at you when you are working on a project with many opinions and notes and do you have a strategy for dealing with that, you know? Again, training as an actor, you're used to taking notes right. and sometimes very confusing notes. <coughs> so I always, I always assume, to begin with, that even if I don't agree or understand the note, that they're pointing towards something that's not working. And that, you know, in acting, you know, the joke among actors is like, as people give you a very involved psychological you know, perhaps, it, not you, <laughs> director, <laughs> who goes on and on about the psychology and you say, do you just want it faster? Is that what you yes, right. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So sometimes it's that and you think, oh, they just want it to be shorter, I think, you know. Or, 
So you try to find the best version. Right. Uh, hopefully you're in business with people you want to make the same movie. Hopefully you've already had that conversation. Diving into those worlds, let's say diving into Dickens or diving into the 1950s or diving into you know Canadian theater in the 60s, um, have you felt that that's carried over to other projects or d did it have an effect as you move forward, even just being inspired maybe by those writers? Well, I miss Dickens because I worked on it for eight years. <laughs> wow. And uh, my children used to talk about my boyfriend, Charles Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little in mourning. Yeah. It's certainly, um, when you get to work on something great, you know, when you're in, those, in the case of Anne and working on material by Charles Dickens, it was, or I have adopted a Chekhov in the theater. It's a tremendous privilege to kind of hang out with great writers and sort of try to think how they do what they do and take, take it apart. So yeah, I certainly feel that I've learned a lot from spending time in the company of those writers, mm. for sure. Yeah. Linwood, did writing for screen has that influenced some of your novel writing or other writing that you do? Did that did that affect it? I don't think so. I think that, that for the very beginning, like I said, when I was a kid, I was addicted to television and wanted to be writing TV scripts as a, as a child. And so all the books that I've done up to the point where I've now started doing adaptations, they all played out in my head as if they were a movie. So I'm, you know, even when I'm you know, writing in the long form, I'm seeing it as if it were on a screen. So. So I don't think that the books that I have done since I've been dabbling in doing adaptations has changed anything. Um, but uh, I've always just seen everything I do. I see it's it's playing out like it's on a screen. Mm. It still is. Great, mm. Arturo. Do you find that working on the narrative feature and adapting the play has that you know changed things or affected you in a way as you move forward on other projects? Um, not necessarily that, but um, I think cemented more uh, the experiments we made with the Dora Boy as far as um, using documentary as a tool to write. So the new project that I'm working on is actually documentary, but using the dialogue that we get from the documentary subjects and then fictionalizing that into a fiction. Uh -huh. So. Um, that kind of like started with the door boy and we're very excited to, to see how this works with the new project. Oh great, that sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, what other projects are you looking forward to? I'd love to hear what you're up to or what's exciting that you're working on now. Well right now I'm, um, I'm working on adapting what I call my Promise Falls trilogy which is the novels Broken Promise Far From True and the 23 for uh, a series working with E1 and a Canadian network on that. So we're, we're in that in development stage where you think, will it really happen or will it not? But I'll, I'll be, it's, the, it's a thing I'll be, uh, I'm very heavily involved in, which is great, and I'll be writing the pilot and so forth. So that's, that's going on at the moment. We'll see, and we'll see what, uh, what happens with that soon, I think. Oh, great, exciting. Uh, and I'm working on a couple of adaptations, actually. One is of a um, series of novels um, by Alan Bradley about an 11-year-old female detective in England in the 50s, the Flavia de Luce series. Oh, wow. And I'm also working, uh, returning to an adaptation that I've been working on again. These things sometimes take time, but of a wonderful George Bowery novel called Caprice, which is a Western Again with a female heroine set in the interior of BC in the end of the 19th century. So both quite different. Wow, and, are, and you're working on them at the same time, so you go from one world to the other? Kind of, like you hand one in, wait for notes, and go to the other one. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. how it kind of works. Right, <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun though. It sounds like, a, like mm, an adventure. Very fun. Very very fun. fun. Yeah. yeah, great. Thanks, and Arturo, you're working on this documentary uh, project? It is, it's yeah. a hybrid. It's more fiction. It's um, basically real news breeding fake stories. Mm. Huh. So wow. it all, each series starts with some real news and then that piece of news affects a character that triggers into a story. Hmm. Interesting. And it's a series? <laughs> like an episodic? It's not episodic. They're standalone. Okay. The, the news are real and they have to happen three months from the story. So it's also like working really fast, like a line production. So when the TV show 
the series comes out, the news still fresh in your head. Mm. Wow. Just three months and then you see what, how that news affected these characters. Oh, mm. neat. Yeah, can we see if it works? <laughs> yeah, I like the experiment yeah, of it. Yeah, it's fun. That's exciting. Uh, well, I look forward to seeing all of these as they, you know, happen. I'm going to say they're going to happen because at this point, <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> why um, not? Why not? Um, I want to say thank you so much to all three of you for being here, thank for you. having this thank conversation, you. for inspiring us with the stories of your writing. And, um, and I want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in and who's listening. Um, it's been a great pleasure to facilitate the conversation and to talk about adapting screenplays. Uh, you can see all of these wonderful projects that we discussed on the internet, on a streaming site near you. We will post the addresses and the destinations for you below this video so you can check them out. Thank you so much for joining us. You can see every episode of the Highball Master Shot right here on highballtv.com. Thanks and see you soon.